Let's read this portion of Scripture together in Proverbs chapter 11, starting in verse 10. When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices, and when the wicked perish, there is jubilation. By the blessing, somebody say blessing. blessing. By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. Let's pray. Father, today I ask in this place that you would give us all a fresh revelation of what it means to believe you for more, to live a truly prosperous life, to be a liberal pool, to allow you to use us to reach out and to change our community and to help change the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So we start our year pretty much the same every year. We like to uh, fast together, and we teach on fasting and prayer. And then right after that, normally, I like to talk about the area of finance. Sometimes we go over 18 months, but uh, usually once a year, we uh, stop passing baskets or bucket or whatever around a number of years ago. Uh, we used to do that, but we really felt that we didn't want people feeling pressured to give because the Bible says not to give uh, if you're pressured or feel com uh, compulsed or, or sh shoved into giving. And so we don't want to do that. But we do think it's important to talk about the area of finance and money because the truth is uh, the Bible talks more about money than any other topic. In fact, if you take a look at faith, how many think faith is important? Faith, the Bible talks about faith uh, about 500 times on the topic of faith. How many think prayer is important? We already mentioned we kick our year off with prayer. In fact, let me just say this. Every Wednesday is prayer and worship. We encourage you to come out. Sometimes I think, well, don't we have youth ministry? Right now, we've put that on hold. Uh, we do have nursery. Our children usually join us. We're praying, and we're worshiping, and they have been powerful services. And so I would encourage you to come out on Wednesday. So we know prayer is important. We really believe that God is calling us to be a prayer church, a church that prays. But the Bible talks about prayer about 500 times. But do you realize that, that on the topic of money or possessions, and how many know you need money to get possessions unless someone gives it to you, but then they used money to buy it before they gave it to you. So money and possessions is talked about, listen, 2,000 times, more than 2,000 times. In fact, Jesus told 38 parables in the Gospels they're recorded. 38 parables, 16, more than half of those have to do with money or possessions. And so we believe it's important to kick off our life, with, or our, our year rather, life also, but our year with fasting, prayer, and then talking about the area of finance. And we just read Proverbs 11. It says, by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. That word blessing means prosperity or liberal pool. God wants us to be a liberal pool. Last week, I said one thing after our, our first teaching on this. I said, if you don't get anything else from this service, you need to leave believing that you're rich. And so here's what we're all going to do right now this morning. Say, I'm rich. You are rich because of what God has done for you. And you'll see scripture after scripture, we'll share more this morning, that Jesus became poor to make us rich. He is getting the kingdom of heaven to us to get it through us to a world that needs it desperately. And so it's important for us to understand the area of finance because money is the number one false god. No, make no bones about it. It is the number one thing that we worship to, uh, next to God. And so we need to work at making sure our hearts are right. We're going to talk about how to break the power of debt in this series. We're going to talk about the fact the Bible talks about how to build a financial um, uh, future for you and your family. But we need to realize one thing. We either control our money or our money will control and limit us. And God wants us to live a limitless life. Say, I, I am limitless. And that's really how we have to view the area of finance and every other area of our lives. Now, last week, we started talking about some common money myths. Number one myth that, that we took care of last week was money is not something we should focus on. Absolutely not true. We should talk about money. In fact, Proverbs 22 says, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. And so the question is, am I in a place where I cannot make kingdom-centered decisions because of my finances? And we, we talked last week, if you weren't here with us, listen, there's hope for you. Say, there's hope, there's hope for, me. for me. And so if you start to honor God, God will give you a way to get out of whatever situation you're in. But money is important, and our thinking must come in line with living a life of abundance and generosity. Regardless of where you are in life, you need to realize that you are generous because of the deposit of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you if you're a believer. If you're not a believer, you can be generous also. It starts with believing in Jesus. Myth number two was God's blessings are not material. 
John 10, 10, Jesus said this, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Just a side note, let me just say this. It says the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. If there's something in your life where you feel like you've been stolen from, if you feel like somebody has been killed or there's been something that has been taken away from you, or if you feel like something is in destruction mode in your life, let me assure you that's not from God. That is the devil. And you need to realize that God is good. And here it says that Jesus came to give us life and what? Give us life more abundantly. That word literally means abundant or zoe is the word. And it means this, the perfect state of living when you have need of nothing. Jesus came to give us a life where we have need of nothing. In Psalms 23, probably the most popular psalm, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack or want or have need. That's God's hearts towards you and I, that we should not lack. We should be in a perfect state of living. It says it means to be exceedingly beyond measure, superior and extraordinary, remarkable, eminent, and more excellent. It sounds like you're bragging about yourself, but listen, it's something God did for you. It's not something you did for yourself. He made you abundant, Zoe, so that the world could see his abundant life through you so they could have it as well. John, uh, 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your what? Soul prospers. We have got to have a healthy soul or mind, will, and emotions about the area of prosperity and the area of money or it's going to be very hard for us to live a life for God. Today I want to uh, carry on with myth number three. Myth number three is this. The Bible teaches that money is evil. All right? I don't know who told you that, but it's not true. It's true that the power of money has the ability to destroy, but money also has the ability to build up. 1 Timothy 6, it says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith to their greedi- or in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Again, money is the number one false god. And if we run after money, if our life is all about money, we are going to become greedy. Listen, people say, well, I, can't, I don't have a problem with money. I don't have any. If all you're focusing on, you have a problem with money. If you, if you are living in an area where all you see is your lack, you have a problem with greed. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings this morning, but that's all you think about is, I could never do that. You think that if you got more, that it would fix your problem. In fact, there's a saying, they say, well, if you just have a problem in some area, just throw some money at it, it'll fix it. Now, it's true the Bible says money answers all things, but it will not fix the problem. Money can make some changes, but it won't fix the problem because the root of the problem is our hearts and our minds towards the area of money. Uh, Money in itself cannot make your life good. Money in and of itself cannot make your life bad. I've used this example for years. I didn't come up with it. I got it from Pastor Dwayne Vanderklok, but I think it's a great example. If I'm walking down the street and there's a drug deal going on and the cops come by and they're going to bust two men who are in in this drug deal and they start to run and the police start to chase them and they drop this big old wad of money on on the ground and I walk up and nobody's there and I pick it up, Whose money is that? That's right. It's my money. Now, I, now I agree we should do our best to try and get it to the rightful owner, but I ain't, I ain't chasing after no drug dealers, all right? There was a point in my life where I was chasing after drug dealers. But listen, that's my money, and at least 10%, probably a whole lot more. In fact, because I came upon it unexpectedly, it probably all would just go into the kingdom. That's just the way Trish and I live. But God wants us all to live that way. The point I want to make is that money will not make me go to the crack house and buy drugs. Your money is a reflection of what's in your heart and what you believe. If you believe you're generous, you'll be generous. If you believe that you have lack, then you'll be greedy. I'm, again, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but it's the truth. Greedy just means we just got to. Here's what the world says. It says you got to get all you can money. You got to put it in a can and then sit on the can. What's mine is mine, and what's yours is mine. Reminds me of a joke. If a man has $5 and his wife has $20, how much money does his wife have? $25. You've heard that before, all right. <laughs> but the world says you just need to get as much as you can. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with having a lot of money, but money in and of itself does not make you generous. In fact, statistics prove this time and again. 
The wealthier people become, the less they give, the less generous they are. And there's a number of reasons, but statistics prove, do you know the most generous people, you're not going to believe this, but statistic after statistic shows that the most generous people are those that are living below forty-five dollars or $50,000 a year, which is considered to be an average income in the nation. Those below, so people really between twenty-five dollars and $50,000 income a year are the most generous. Now, we're talking percentage, giving the most out of what they have. And again, there's a number of reasons for that, but we think, well, you know, the rich are just generous because they have more money. No, it's not true. So many times people think, well, once I win the lottery, once I, once I, I win at blackjack over at the casino, then I'm going to give all my money to the church. No, you won't. If, if you have you been, have you been down at the casino, Karen? Oh, my goodness. What? <laughs> What kind of parents are you? No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just having fun with you over there. Okay. But so many times we think, well, I just can't. Listen, if you can't, if you can't get that crinkled up old dollar bill out of your wallet, you're not going to give if you had a lot. It's just the truth. And so we need to realize that money is just a reflection of what we think. It's a reflection of what we think. In fact, 1 Timothy 6 we just read it. It says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from their faith and the greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. How many know that having a nice, warm fire in a fireplace at this time of year especially is nice? How many know that you can enjoy that? But if you take that same fire that, that looks so beautiful and keeps you warm and cozy, if you took it and just built it right on the floor, your house would burn down. How many know? So it's, it's not the fire that's bad. It's what you did with the fire. All right? And it's the same with money. In fact, it can become something that we trust and worship. In fact, it can become something that is an idol. 1 Timothy 6, it says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And really, I believe the key to prosperity in our mind, our will, and our emotions is really to be content. You need to be content. What does that mean? That you're satisfied where you are, but believing God for more, and you're so satisfied that your needs are met that you're generous with what you have. I really believe that's what contentment is. In fact, you look at this word godliness, and if you break it down, this is what it means. God in his fullness, his purpose is living fully formed in and through me. So godliness, again, God in his fullness, his purpose is living fully formed in and through me. How many think God is generous? How many think Jesus is generous? Well, the Bible says in Romans 8, 11 and elsewhere that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Again, a generous spirit is living on the inside. And so God, in all his fullness, his purpose is living fully formed in and through you is literally the definition of godliness. And that's where God wants to get us. Alexander Dumas writer said this, do not value money for any more nor any less than it's worth. It's a good servant, but a bad master. Listen, we need to rule our money or it will dictate and limit us as far as the kingdom of heaven. First Timothy 6, 17 says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. See, God gives us all things to enjoy. We said last week, it all belongs to him anyway. So the question is, how good of a manager or steward am I with the things that God gives me? And this goes beyond money. I think it starts with money because money is so important. We all need money. Money is something that we have changed, something that has value. You work a number of hours, 40, 50 hours, whatever it is. Your employer then gives you money in exchange for your time. And so money really is a reflection of our life. And so that's why it's so important. And that's why it's really important that we honor God first with it and realize that he wants us to be godly, that we want to have a mind of generosity, the heart of the Father, if you will. Here's myth number four. Myth number four is, well, Jesus modeled scarcity. Well, that's not true. People will say, well, didn't Jesus live a meager life? Wasn't the gospel that he presented one of a frugal lifestyle? What about the saints of old? People say, what about Francis of Assisi or even someone more contemporary like Mother Teresa of Calcutta? Didn't they model a life of scarcity? And you'd have to say, yes, from time to time, God does call people to live with less. I believe that. 
But that is not what the gospel teaches is the sign of holiness. Paul the Apostle said this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. He says, I know how to have a lot. I know how to have a little. It's Christ who strengthens me. Regardless of whether we have a lot or have a little, it's Christ at the center that I can be generous. And so Jesus didn't really model scarcity. In fact, I don't think Jesus modeled lack at all. It's true he didn't have a lot of this world's possessions. There's a reason for that. We'll get to it in a moment. But Jesus never lacked anything. I know I said this last week, but it probably amazes me more than just about anything in the Bible. There was one time. In fact, did you know Jesus had a treasure? His name was Judas. He betrayed him. How many know if you have a treasure, you got some money that needs treasuring? All right? In fact, they said that he used to take money from the purse and give it to the poor quite often. Jesus was generous. He gave to the poor out of what he had. All right? And I wrote this down as I was going over my notes just this morning, in fact. So what I really believe by the Spirit of God. Holiness is not about not having things, but rather things not having us. And certainly it is true that some people are called to live a life without things of this world, to lay things down. But listen, they have a call to reach people in certain parts of the world, and without the money that you and I give them, they couldn't accomplish what God's called them to do. That's why we believe in missions. That's why we support so many missions around the world. Get on our website. Check it out. You'll see about us. You go to missions, you'll see. We just had a Solanto here from Haiti. We're having a mission trip in September going to Haiti. We believe that we need to be reaching out around the world and helping those who are in need. All right? Mother Teresa, let's take that example. Uh, Mother Teresa was never shy about the money that she needed to really help those who were suffering in Calcutta. One time she accepted money from a hated Haitian dictator. And people said, you can't take that money. That's blood money. It was about $1,000. People said it was more than that, but it was about $1,000 if you check the story. But people said, you can't take his money. That's blood money. That's a mean dictator. Tater, you can't take his money. You know what she said? She said, in charity, everyone has a right to give. I have no right to judge them. God alone has that right. I do not ask for money, but people have a right to give. And she took money. And she wasn't afraid to admit that she needed money for her causes. And many people helped her. I think we can err on either one side or the other if we think that Jesus was either poor or that he was rich. I've heard some people say, well, Jesus was really rich. Jesus was not the richest person in his village. That is not true. And if you read the Gospels, you'll see it's not true. However, again, Jesus never lacked, ever. Never had need everywhere he went. In fact, where he went, other people were blessed because of his presence there. You may not have known this, but Jesus had financial supporters. Look at this, Luke 8, 3. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others. Somebody say many. Many. I checked, and in the Greek, many means a lot. All right. You didn't know I was that smart, did you? Well, it's true. Say many. Many. All right. And many others who provided for him from their substance. Jesus had financial supporters. So to fulfill his ministry, you think about it, God, who could do it any way he wanted to, allowed people to support him financially. And so for us to think, well, all preachers want is our money, that's ridiculous, first of all. That's a reflection of our heart. But if it was really ungodly for us to give to those who were called into the five-fold ministry, if you will, as preaching and teaching and pastoring and what, what have you. If, if, it was, if it was not the kingdom of heaven or God's desire, then Jesus couldn't have accepted this money. Does that make sense? Amen. So many times I have people say, and we're not going to talk about the tithe today. I think in this series we'll probably uh, get to that subject at some point. Um, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I want you to realize that you're rich. Say, I'm rich. I'm rich. And really it's about our mindset when it comes to finances. But I've had people so many times say, well, you know, Pastor, the tithe isn't for today. I was, it's under the law. Don't put me under the law. I'm under grace. No, you're rebellious, and you don't want to do what anybody tells you to do. <laughs> In fact, the number 10, which is tithe, 10%, that's what, again, I'm not going to get into detail on this, but number 10 in the Bible is the, time of, it, it, is the number of testing. All right? It's the number of testing. And so God tests us with money. He really does. But if I have people come and say, well, you know, pastor, it's not for today. We're under grace. We're not under law. I've got this question I ask people now. I picked this up just a couple years ago. Somebody comes and says that. I say, okay, I'm just curious. Are you asking because you want to give less or give more? 
The conversation's usually over right there. Because it's about our heart. If we're trying to figure out, well, we're not under law, it's because you don't want to give anything because you're... You insert whatever word you want because I'm not going to be... All right. I'm not going to be hated any more than I already am, so let's say that. <laughs> Even though Jesus lived with few human possessions, he never lacked, and I believe there was a reason that he gave up earthly possessions. Let's read this, 2 Corinthians 8. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might what? Become rich. Let's think about this for a moment. The word here the Bible uses, all right, about riches denotes that all of heaven was at his disposal. Abounding in material resources, including natural resources. Abounding. In fact, if you take a look in the Bible, in heaven, God paves streets with gold. There is no lack. There is no scarcity. Jesus left everything, literally. Came here, and through his poverty, he wanted us to become what? What's that? Rich. What? Excuse me? Rich. Say, I'm rich. See, Jesus did this as part of his mission. He never had lack, but he was trying to get the kingdom of heaven to us, to get it through us, to get it to other people. And until we surrender our lives, and certainly in the area of finance, I really think it's a test. I think it starts here. If we can't honor God in our finances, I think it's very hard to live for him in other areas of our life. I really believe that. Last week, we saw 2 Corinthians 9, 8. It says, you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. God's desire is for us to have an abundance for every good work. To give into everything, someone comes knocking at the door. You don't need to hide. <laughs> you can be generous. That's what God wants us to be. In fact, whenever Jesus performed a miracle, he never did just enough. It was always more than enough. The kingdom of heaven is always overflowing. It's more than enough. How many know, not anyone who was in first service, how many know the one miracle, of all the miracles recorded in the Gospels, there's one miracle that's only one that's in all four. How many know what it is? Oh, nobody did. One person knew. Karen? Karen? How did you, did you learn that at a casino last night or what? No, I just, she's right, feeding the 5,000. If you couldn't hear her, she said feeding the 5,000. It's the one miracle that Jesus worked that's recorded in all four Gospels. And most, if not all, Bible scholars believe that it was more than 5,000 because it says 5,000 men, and many of those men probably had families. So this multitude was huge, 15, 20, not that 5,000 isn't huge. They took a boy's lunch, literally fish and chips, and fed the whole multitude. 5,000 would have been enough, but let's say 15, 20,000. And not only did they feed them all, they had 12 baskets that I believe he sent home with the disciples. They go take this home. I mean, that's, so here's a person who left riches, everything at his disposal, the kingdom of heaven, came here, became poor for us to be rich, yet had no scarcity, wasn't tied down to this world's things, and, but he was able to bless people everywhere he went, brought healing, brought deliverance, brought kind words, brought hard words of truth, like this message today. But the, but the bottom line is Jesus never lacked. And so as people of God, as Christians, as people of the kingdom of heaven, we cannot have a lack of, Mentality. So wherever you are in life today, you need to start to look at things differently. You need to be renewed in your mind to start to think about the things of finance and resources and generosity from a kingdom-minded perspective. No matter where you are, you've got something to give somebody, and God wants you to start today. There were times that Jesus sent his disciples out with nothing. You can certainly find that recorded in the Gospels, but I believe it was because God was teaching them, Jesus was teaching them about ministry and how they would have to go out sometimes with nothing. That's kind of just how ministry is. God calls you to plant a church, five-fold ministry, apostles, pastors, evangelists, prophets, teachers. When you're called into that, missionaries fall into that area. If God's calling you to start a ministry like that, sometimes you go out without nothing. 
I remember years ago when we were part of a church planning team, we didn't even, my gosh, we had no idea what we were doing 20, 25 years ago. Oh, my gosh. But we just go out and just believe God. I've even had people, I've had people say, well, you know, Pastor, uh, you, you don't need our money. You just need to believe God. And I'll say, well, why don't you just believe God and write me a big old fat check? I mean, you know, people, well, you need to believe God, Pastor. You don't think this isn't believing God, teaching a message like this, when I know everybody's hungry and they're ready to stone me? <laughs> but the truth is, God wants us all to have faith. God wants us all to be blessed and to be part of the gospel message in every area of our lives, not just finance, but I believe finance is so important. I do believe there's times in life where we're going to have seasons of trial, seasons of testing. God never promises that we won't. But the way we react in that season of testing determines where we're going to go from there. A uh, Bible teacher, uh, not a pastor any longer, was a pastor at one time, a Bible teacher, author, Dr. Samuel Chand, he says this, teaching on finances. He says, it is my response in the middle of my need that positions me for abundance. And this is true anywhere, by the way, not just in finance, but it certainly applies to that, and this was the topic he was speaking on. I watched him teach on this. He said, it is my response in the middle of my need that positions me for abundance. He also said this, abundance happens one step at a time. What does that mean? You've got to be patient. I've had people say over the years, they say, well, you know, I tried that tie than once, Pastor. What we do is we give a certain amount of money and then we don't see it come right away and we give up and we quit. We think we're going to be blessed immediately. Listen, it's a test. So if you go and, you know, if you go to the store and you buy somebody's groceries, don't be standing there and say, oh, I'll, I'll buy those groceries for that person and you're feeling all good about yourself. And you, and you take and you, it's $200, all you got is $200 in your wallet and then you you pay for that, and then your groceries come up. Don't turn to the person behind you and say, uh, next. <laughs> that, that, look, you cannot, when we think it's going to be immediate, we are missing the principle. It's not about getting more. It's really about you giving up more and willing to live on less so that he can give you more. You know, it, it's the truth. Because when you can live on less, he'll open up the gates of heaven, and give you more when you're satisfied and content. And number three, he said this in his teaching I thought was so interesting. Keep your eyes on the source. Keep your eyes on the source, all right? So that means when you put money, well, we don't pass a basket here, but when you, when you put money, if you give with the box in the back or if you give online or however you choose to do it, don't, like, push that send money if you're giving online and just go, bye-bye. Oh, I was going to go have a big old steak today. Oh, I sure hope the church spends that right. Don't, don't look at it. You need to, what you need to do is give, rejoice, and say, Jesus, you're the author and the finisher of my faith. My trust is in you. Keep your focus on him. He's your source. Your job is not your source. The place you gave to supporting the ministry does not determine your increase. Now, I do believe that we shouldn't repeatedly give into a ministry, something that we think there is really no return. I, I understand that. But understand, you're not responsible to say, well, they, mis they misspent that money. If you've given into a ministry and you think they spent it wrong, that's between them and God. God will bless you for your faith. You realize that, don't you? Now, as stewards, pastors, ministry leaders, evangelists, and so on, have a responsibility to be frugal, but also to sow. That's why we sow. I mean, over the past uh, six years, we've given over 15%. Out, out of our four walls. And we'll continue to give more as, as God allows. But we, we, we want to, so we believe in this, all right? And so we'll, we'll just keep doing that. So it's my response in the middle of my need that positions me for abundance. Abundance happens one step at a time. So be patient and keep your eyes on the source. You may say, well, the disciples left everything to follow Jesus, and you'd be, you'd be right. Again, Jesus was calling them into five-fold ministry, if you will, to take the message once he was done here on earth. And there was one time where a rich young ruler came, and Jesus said, one thing you lack, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, come follow me. And the Bible says the rich man could not do that because he had great wealth. 
he turned away and he was sad and sorrowful. And the disciples talked to Jesus. They say, well, gosh, if he can't follow, what's that mean? And Jesus said, it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, he said, it's harder or easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Think about that. People debate, what does that mean? It means a camel through the eye of a needle. That's what it means. All right. And there's all kinds of teachings about. Sometimes I hear th- teachings, and listen, I, I'm a teacher, but when, when we take things that are there and make something out of them, that bugs me as a teacher. So it's not what he's, he was literally saying, a needle. It's impossible. Can't do it. People just say, well, it's hard because the camel could go through something called the eye of a needle in the gates. I've heard all these teachings. No, it was, it's impossible. Understand this. Listen. And then he says what's impossible with man is what? Possible with God. Let me just say this. No one can come into the kingdom of heaven on their own merit. Nobody. And so the disciples said, man, we left everything. (laughs) What What about us? And here's what Jesus said. I love this. Jesus said, assuredly, what does that mean? For sure. All right. So for sure, I say to you, there's no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children. or Did you see all this? We can't put anything before Jesus. Now, it doesn't say we don't take care of our family. In fact, if we don't, the Bible says we're worse than an unbeliever. We should provide for our families. But if these things in life, including family that we love, lands, money, jobs, whatever, if anything prohibits us from living a life of generosity in any area, we can't really follow Jesus. That's really what he's teaching here. But listen what he says. Assuredly, if you've done that, verse 30, for my sake and the gospel... You shall, not receive, you shall now receive a hundredfold in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution. Say testing. testing. Say testing. testing. All right. And in the age to come, eternal life. There's times he'll call us to walk away from everything and lay it down. And we need to live that way. I've said this before. Uh, there's nothing that Trish and I have that we wouldn't give away or sell if God told us to. And we've done it multiple times. All right? We've sold houses, haven't given a house away yet. But when it's completely paid for, which will be soon, if God asked me to, I would. But I'd have to know it was God. So don't come knocking on my door and say, God said you're supposed to give me your... No, that... (laughs) But the thing is, if we lay those things down, I'm not telling you what to do. And again, you need to take steps where you are. But he wants us, he doesn't want anything to have a hold on us in this world. Sometimes he'll call us to move. Trish and I have had to move several times to follow the call of God in in our life. And I'm not saying God's going to move you. Most people are called to stay put where they are. That's the truth. But God does call people to move and moves them into other cities and states and countries and different churches. God God can do all that. How many know that? But then we need to be obedient because so many times we don't want to leave our family. We don't want to leave our friends. We don't want to leave our nice house, our money, whatever, our jobs. But if those things keep us from fulfilling the call of God in our lives, those things are a problem. And that's really what God's trying to get us to realize is that all these things, all these things that money can buy, if they're more important, it's going to be very hard for us to fulfill the kingdom of heaven in our lives. Myth number five. (laughs) I love this one. God's kingdom doesn't need any money. Okay. Well, if Jesus had a treasure, how many already said he could have chosen to do it a lot of different ways, but you need money. In fact, the disciples, before he multiplied the boys' lunch, they said, do you want us to go and buy dinner for all these? Because they had money. They did say, boy, it's going to be expensive. That's what they said, but they, they talked about going to buy it. So I'm not saying did they have enough or didn't they, but they must have had something. They wouldn't have even asked it. So do you want us to go buy? Where would we go? We're out in the wilderness. Where would we go and buy? They said, well, what do you have? So certainly money is something that we need. In fact, Jesus taught us to pray that the kingdom of heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done. Again, he's trying to get the kingdom of heaven in us to get it through us into other people. Well, how's that going to happen? How's that going to take place if we lack supply, if we lack finances? I've got a statistic. Maybe I'll share it next week. I don't have it in front of me, so I don't want to misquote it. But do you know that if if the church, if 100% of the church just gave 10% of their income regularly, 
We could literally wipe out world hunger, disease. The statistics, I'll share it next week, so you come back next week. I don't, have it, I don't have it in front of me, and I want to show you. It's true. Someone has worked these numbers who's smarter than me. And I believe it because such a small percent of Christians, in fact, statistics show that it's way below. It's 2%, one and a half to 2% of people who consider themselves Christians worldwide that he'd give anything financially. And I understand it's hard because it's the area where the, the devil wants us to think that we can't go without. But God wants us to say, oh, I can give you more. But we, he, we have to start to think abundant thoughts. I believe with all of my heart, and this is why we teach this at the beginning of every year. Number one, if God can get the church praying and fasting and worshiping. And number two, if he can get money out of our pockets into preaching the gospel, we'll have revival. So many people say, well, we're just waiting on God for revival. I think God's waiting on us. He's given us everything we need. But we're holding on to it. It's like a pastor once said, and I, I like to get a lot of mileage out of this. Say, I got good news and bad news. The pastor stood up in front of his congregation. So the good news is we have all the money that we need to reach our city and do what God called us to do. And the bad news, it's still in your pockets. <laughs> Just having fun with you. Oh. That's why pastors don't like to talk about this. But you know what? I stopped caring about that stuff a long time ago. So, and if you know me for a while, you say, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I try to be friendly. It's just harder for me than some people. No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just teasing you. Just teasing you. But we, as the body of Christ, we have got to get a hold of this, that he has given us everything we need. But the problem is we get so caught up in life, our needs, our desires, our retirement. There's nothing wrong with having plans for retirement, but if retirement and your plan for retirement keeps you from being generous, is retirement about... Because I've had people say, well, you know, we're just working hard and saving as much money as we can, going to pay everything off, and then we'll serve God. Yeah, probably down in the Caribbean somewhere. Again, yeah, there's nothing wrong with saving. It's all smart stuff. Be smart with our money. But if you think, well, you know, I'll serve God when. No, you won't because you won't do it now. And God's trying to get our hearts. And I don't know about you, but I'd like to see revival. This world's pretty messed up. I don't know if you've noticed that lately. It's, it's getting worse. Have you noticed that? People are getting dumber. Have you noticed that? <laughs> you say, well, pastor, that isn't very nice. I, I, if you watch the news, can you even bear to watch the news? <laughs> wow. Wow. The Bible says there'll come a time when they call good evil and evil good, and we're there. We are there. And it's up to us. You know, it says that God is patient because he wants everyone to come into the kingdom. I think God is just like, come on, church. Oh, I just want to bring, I want to bring my son back. I want to give my son his glorious bride. We're the bride of Christ. You know that, don't you? That's what the Bible says. I believe he just cannot wait for that marriage supper. He can't wait to give his son in marriage to the church. But you know what the problem is? The church wants to just have one last affair before they get married. Just one more little thing, Jesus, and then I'll be yours forever. You may think that's kind of harsh, but I don't know how else to put it. God wants our hearts. God wants us to take comfort in him. God wants us to really be in love with him when the things of this world are more important to us than serving the body of Christ, than serving one another, than reaching out to those around us. The problem is we're just having one more affair with the world, one more thing that's got us tangled up, one more thing that's more important than Jesus. And as Christians, nothing else should be more important. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be sanctified. You know, holy and sanctified mean almost the same thing. They mean set apart. Mm. God ultimately is the one that's set apart. He is true holiness, true deity. But he's called us and made us holy and sanctified. And then we also sanctify ourselves, set ourselves apart. And 
unfortunately this may not hold much weight today but if you think about Tony and I were just having a discussion with a man a brief discussion about marriage and how statistics prove people are waiting longer to get married which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing but statistics are proved we're just talking to this young man he's not saved yet but we're believing he will be yeah. he's not saved yet but he says well I'm just waiting he says because I don't want to be another divorce statistic not even a Christian young man Engagement, when you take a look at the Jewish sense of it, really, when an engagement happens, and I've shared this before, but I, I feel an urgency to, to share it today, where a man would engage his bride and say, I'm going to marry you, and it's going to be at a later date. Then the man would, in many cases, go and prepare a place for his bride to live in his father's house. Does sound familiar? Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many rooms, many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus is engaged in the church. you got to realize this is in a Jewish engagement. Then he'd go and get everything ready, make sure there was a place for him and his wife. I mean, no, that's important. Yeah, all right. And then the bride was to go and to be with her bridesmaids. And she had a pledge of virginity. And she was to be about the business of making her wedding gown or preparing her wedding gown or even repairing one that maybe that was used by a mother or whatever, whatever the case may be. But making this wedding gown, making sure that it was without spot, without wrinkles. Is this, any bells going off, anybody? And my fear is, if it is a fear that God looks at us and say, you're a wrinkly mess, I can't come back yet. People say, well, are you just waiting for revival? Jesus is waiting for us to pick up the needle and the thread and to make ourselves pure. He's given us what we need. Oh, I'm not saying you got to be perfect. That's ridiculous. But is your life surrendered to him? And maybe it's not. Maybe today, maybe you've never made that decision. We're going to sing one more song. we get just a few minutes together here. It's kind of a love song, so this is appropriate. And if you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I want to encourage you to come forward. If you need prayer for anything, I, I expect to see this altar crowded, by the way. Because if you're here in a service like this and every area in your life is surrendered to him the way it should be, come on. Good word. I'm done preaching. Come on. you got something for us. Now, if you don't come down here, I'm not trying to guilt trip you. Some of you may not be able to or maybe you feel comfortable. If we don't have... I mean, we, to sit in our seats, maybe just bow where you are. Came in this morning, a group that's praying before service, they're all just spread out. Their heads bowed down in chairs throughout this sanctuary. But we should all say, God, there's something in my life that's it's, it's taking precedent over. It, it doesn't mean he doesn't want us to have things, but do things have you? Do other things have you that are keeping you from living? Somebody's got, you're bold, aren't you? Go ahead, you preach it, buddy. Uh, I was reading this last night. It's weird that you talked about it today. Uh, it's in 2 Corinthians 6. And it says, But this I say, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one of us, as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work as it is written. He has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now, may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for life support, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are in in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints but also the abounding service not, uh, through many thanksgivings to God while through the proof of this ministry they glorify God for the obedience of their confession to the 
gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with all men, with everyone, and by their prayer for you long and because of the, the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for the incredible gift. And then it goes on to talk about the spiritual warfare. And I'd recommend that reading, but I'm kind of nervous. I've never spoken publicly. I love you guys. I learned to tithe up here. I came to this church, and they passed a plate. Well, you know, people are looking, throwing a dollar or two in there. And uh, sometimes I remember when I first started doing that, I was wondering, how am I going to get money out of that plate without anybody noticing? surrender your heart to Christ. It's just, it's just as simple as a prayer. You don't have to get yourself ready to come to God. Just say, that's it. I want it. Come forward. We have prayer partners down here who will pray with you for any need that you have. Let's come down and let's worship God. And let's pray for one another. See you real soon. God, that's that's going to be it. We're going to worship. If you need to go, go. But I would encourage you to stay a little while longer. We love you. Hope to see you Wednesday at 7. God bless you. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.